I want to start by saying thank you to the program committee for inviting me to speak. It is a true pleasure to be on uh, the program with this faculty. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist. I've been working at Holy Cross Hospital for about 25 years, but my career path has taken me in a lot of different directions from long-term residential treatment, uh, I've done forensic work and all kinds of things and consider myself a rehabilitation neuropsychologist. I wanna start with uh, a little bit of history. These are some of our forefathers on the common path that led us to this place. Uh, up here in no particular order is Alexander Luria who is probably best known as the father of modern neuropsychology. Below him to the right, many of you from Boston probably recognize Norman Geschwind, the father of behavioral neurology. Over here next to him it was Ward Halstead, who is pretty much the father of American neuropsychology. And across the bottom are some of the great names in neurology and psychiatry. Of course, uh, we have Sigmund Freud, uh, who was a study a student of Jean Charcot, who was in the bottom in the middle, and next to him, Paul Broca, who introduced us in many ways to the localization theories in uh, neuropsychology and neuroscience. So psychiatry and neuropsychology come from common backgrounds. We both have relied on methods of diagnosis that relied on behavioral observation. Psychiatry mostly observed the response to treatment in the early days using techniques like hypnosis, free association or interpretation of dreams. In the mid 19th century, patients with known neurologic disorders like Phineas Gage, who is well known for a tamping rod being shot through his frontal lobe, and Le Bourne, who was Broca's first patient, who had specific disorders of language associated with the left frontal lobe. So following these kinds of observations in patients, a lively debate uh, ensued regarding whether or not the brain operated as a holistic organ or that there were localized areas responsible for specific brain functions. In 1879, Wilhelm Wundt, who was originally a physician, opened the first psychology lab in Leipzig with many experiments focusing on human cognition. And in the early 1900s, Binet, who was a student of Charcot and his colleagues in France began the formal testing of mental abilities, developing the first IQ test. Both disciplines evolved rapidly after World War II. Uh, many veterans who survived injuries that they would have died of in earlier conflicts came back to the United States and in other places with neurologic and psychiatric disorders and provided a large pool of subjects for study. In terms of the scope of practice, there are many similarities. Neuropsychologists uh, diagnose and treat cognitive and mental disorders. We do it in a variety of settings. We get referrals from a variety of sources. Our treatments are non-medical because we're not medical doctors and team collaboration is often a part of how the neuropsychologist interacts with other disciplines to care for patients. Psychiatrists also diagnose and treat mental disorders. More of their focus is on the mental disorders rather than on the cognitive disorders. Their settings are the same, referrals are the same, treatments are both non-medical and medication-based, and team collaboration, in my experience, is less common 
than in neuropsychology. The two disciplines began to diverge probably in the early to mid 20th centuries. First of all, psychologists who were working in a variety of settings contributed to development of neuropsychology as a discipline. As a discipline, we're still in our infancies as in terms of being a unique specialty. The International Neuropsychology Society was founded in 1967 as an interdisciplinary uh, group with medical doctors, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, uh, neurologists, psychiatrists, and uh, various specialties in psychology, including experimental cognitive psychologists, clinical psychologists, and neuropsychologists. The National Academy of Neuropsychology uh, was formed in 1975, and the Division of Neuropsychology of the APA was formed in 1979 and began the formalization of training in neuropsychology. In terms of psychiatry, advances in biochemistry and pharmacology influenced the growth of psychiatry as a medical discipline. Uh, an early study by Bradley found that children treated with benzodrine showed drastic imp uh, improvements in uh, behavior that we would today associate with conditions like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And John Cade in 1948 uh, discovered the benefit of lithium in patients with psychiatric disorders. Until the mid to late 70s, neuropsychology remained the best non-invasive option for understanding brain structure and function. With the invention of advanced neuroimaging technology, uh, neuropsychologists were no longer needed to identify whether or not there was actual brain damage based on performance on neuropsychological tests, imaging studies could identify strokes, tumors, and other brain abnormalities. Uh, but neuropsychologists remained vital to understand the functional consequences of those kinds of brain abnormalities. And of course, there are a number of brain conditions uh, still today that do not show up on imaging or electrophysiological studies. The training of Neuropsychologists and psychiatrists is obviously different. Uh, neuropsychologists have doctoral degrees in psychology, uh, a PhD or a PsyD degree, with a PhD being more of a research-oriented program and the PsyD more practice-oriented. But to get a degree in clinical psychology, the American Psychological Association accredits programs that conform to a specific program that covers basic areas of psychological function, biological, cognitive, affective, social, and developmental, along with coursework and assessment and treatment methods. Students obviously have the option of specializing in uh, De developmental child psychology or forensic or other areas of clinical psychology. They will typically have two full year halftime practica during their second or third year and a one year accredited internship pre-doctoral. The training programs that have been outlined for neuropsychologists were formalized in the mid to late 1980s and require courses in basic neuroscience, functional neuroanatomy, neuropathology, clinical neurology, psychological and neuropsychological assessment, psychological pathology, and intervention. So 
Psychiatrists, of course, have medical degrees. Uh, I chose to share the four-year residency program for Mass General, since I'm speaking to that audience. Uh, when I started researching residency programs in psychiatry, I found a fair amount of variability um, and some consistency across programs, but rather than uh, try to distill it down, I just picked this particular program that includes um, what looks like uh, basic uh, focus in psychiatric in a variety of settings. Uh, four years, obviously, in different settings, and uh, residents get to specialize just like uh, psychology residents might in areas of interest. And in year four, uh, which is pretty much a, a clinical year, what I wanted to point out is that it is pretty much all uh, medication base that in that last year, they might be seeing 25 to 30 patients a week, but only two to three therapy cases. So psychologists in their treatment are practicing therapy where psychiatrists uh, today engage in very little therapy. There are psychiatrists who do specialize still in psychoanalysis. And I suspect those practices uh, include much more therapy than the typical psychiatry practice. The methods we use are different. Psychologists uh, will uh, interview patients in my office. I take a complete history or as complete a history as I can, uh, review appropriate records, and then we do formal neuropsychological testing uh, with data interpretation and report writing and make recommendations for intervention. I will say that the uh, American approach to neuropsychology is very systematic using a lot of standardized tests and age uh, norms to characterize patients' strengths and weaknesses on testing. Uh, the European model, uh, following Yuri, uh, Luria's example, was a more hypothesis testing approach where the history suggests that there might be problems in a particular area of cognitive functioning. And he would expose his patients to stimuli to test that hypothesis, uh, not using uh, norm referenced uh, tables or uh, similar standardized uh, measures. Americans, we like, we like data. So uh, a group in Nebraska took Luria's methods and formalized and standardized his techniques and created the Luria Nebraska Neuropsychological Test Battery. <clears throat> uh, there's also a difference um, in various uh, approaches to neuropsychology in this country. The Neuropsychological School of uh, Halstead and Ray Tan were very much interested in product and how does somebody perform on the test where the Boston School was known as the process school. So what is the cognitive process that leads somebody to do well or do poorly on a neuropsychological test? So there are more flexible batteries for those who um, subscribe to the Boston approach or the process approach and more standardized batteries that are used by uh, those people subscribing to the Raytan approach. In psychiatry, diagnoses typically rely on interview history and following DSM diagnostic criteria. 
treatment usually involves psychopharmacology uh, and uh, there are all, certainly a lot of patients who get both uh, psychopharmacology and psychotherapy, but the emphasis in psychiatry, unless there's a specialty in neuropsychiatry is more on uh, the common mental disorders related to anxiety, depression, bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, and the like. Neuropsychology is typically a diagnostic subspecialty. And in the early days, the question was, is there brain damage? And again, there is the issue of localization versus process or holistic, how do various brain regions work together to perform cognitive tasks uh, with changes in imaging technology. Our job as neuropsychologists focused more on functional impairment and whether or not people can live alone or return to work if they've been injured or what kinds of uh, accommodations might somebody need in the workplace or in school uh, based on their level of functioning. In this country, like I said, there is a huge reliance on objective testing data, but we also use self-report and other report data because the observations we make in the office don't always reflect what's happening outside the office in their natural lives. Uh, psychiatry is mostly a treatment discipline. Modern psychiatry relies heavily on drug treatment, uh, less commonly, but still effective is electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is getting uh, more credibility and some psychiatrists, like I said, do still practice therapy. There is a reliance on clinical interviewing for diagnosis. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association does encourage the use of questionnaires for diagnosis and treatment, but the consistency with which psychiatrists use those methods in practice uh, is probably less than it is for uh, neuropsychologists. And with that in mind, I want to share a couple of uh, quotes that have come from people who have studied the difference between using objective data versus subjective clinical impressions. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, who is, a, who is well known for his study of bias in decision making, stated that overconfident professionals believe they have expertise, act as experts, and look like experts. And you'll have to struggle to remind yourself that they may be in the grip of an illusion uh, based on their own personal biases as they uh, perform their, their duties medically. Uh, one of my professors in graduate school, Stuart Oskamp, made a name for himself uh, in his dissertation. Not many of us make a career out of our dissertation, but Dr. Oskamp found that accuracy did not increase significantly with increasing information, but confidence increased steadily and significantly. When uh, subjects were judging, all but two became overconfident, most of them markedly so. Clearly increasing feelings of confidence are not a sure sign of increasing predictive accuracy about a case. So there's certainly a time and a place for both clinical judgment, but objective data is very important. Um, so there's a need for us to converge and to cooperate in our work because patients with neurologic disorders often have comorbid psychiatric and psychological problems. Multi-method assessment offers data that clarifies the problem and adds to effective treatment planning. Many neurologic disorders are chronic and require a team approach for effective treatment, and both medical and non-medical treatment methods contribute to improve symptom mitigation and improve quality of life. And in conclusion, uh, I wanna reiterate that Neuropsychologists and psychiatrists evolve through similar pathways. 
through the neurosciences and medicine. Divergence in the development of these specialties came through advances in biological treatments and advances in understanding of brain behavior relationships. Our knowledge of the etiology, natural history, diagnosis, and treatment of brain disorders continues to evolve at a rapid rate with continued advances in research. Those specialties make important contributions to the diagnosis and treatment of individuals with neurologic disorders. And there's always a need for collaborative team approaches to advancing understanding of treatment that includes these as well as other specialties for these complex cases. <clears throat> 